Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for being here. My name is Mary C. Murphy, and I'm a lecturer in politics in the uh, Department of Government and Politics here in UCC. Um, and uh, we're here today for the third in the Jean Monnet lecture series. Uh, we previous, previously had Dennis McShane, a former UK Minister for Europe, and also Attain Tannum from uh, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, but today I'm delighted to welcome Tony Connolly, the Europe editor, RTE Europe editor. Uh, to UCC for his second visit to the college. Uh, the last one was quite a few years ago. Um, Tony has had a very long journey here today. He was on a bus from Derry at 10 to 6 this morning. Mm. So, uh, be gentle. <laughs> be gentle. Um, Tony, I, Tony doesn't need any introduction, to be honest. Uh, you, you all know him. He's a very familiar figure. Um, his book, however, Brexit on Ireland, The Dangers, the Opportunities and the Inside Story of the Irish Response, has been one of the first, one of the most comprehensive and one of the most intriguing reads on Brexit on Ireland that I've certainly read. Um, and Tony has just told me that the next edition of that book is due out in the next few weeks, updated uh, to February of this year. So um, well, well worth a purchase, I think. Um, Tony, as I said, is the, uh, the Europe editor for RTE. Um, and he's been working in Brussels for many years, but I think Brexit has really become his bread and butter over the last couple of years. He's also one of the top five news journalists on Twitter, as ranked by the Murray Tweet Index. Um, and uh, he's here today to talk about the negotiations specifically, and uh, the title is Brexit Negotiating the Negotiation. So <coughs> sincere thanks, Tony, for making such a long trip here, and we very much look forward to your contribution. Thank you very much, Mary. It's a great pleasure to be back in Cork. Um, the last time I was here, Graham Norton got his uh, honorary degree, so uh, I don't know if that sort of registers the uh, the timeline of that. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk about the Brexit negotiations. Um, I suppose the, a, a simple start would be why do we need negotiations uh, for for Britain leaving the European Union? And it, it's often something you hear on on BBC radio if they do vox pops in, in some of the big leave voting constituencies in the UK. People often say, you know, I thought we were out already. Like, why why aren't we already out of the EU? Why do we need these negotiations? The reason is that Britain's a member and the negotiations are governed by Article 50 of the treaty. So Britain has to abide by that. And I think the key essence of Article 50 is that Brexit happens in the least disruptive way. So they want uh, to avoid a disorderly exit. So that means Article 50 defines how Britain leaves. Uh, and it's, it's the classic unscrambling the omelette or taking the egg out of the omelette that the Article 50 is trying to deal with. And from an Irish point of view, this is really key because there are three key areas that have to be handled in the Article 50 negotiations. And one of them is Ireland, because the most disorderly part of Brexit is Ireland. There's, there's no doubt about that. The, the, the potential for Brexit to upend and undermine the Good Friday Agreement is there for all to see. Uh, it, it is also a major economic disruption for Ireland, both in terms of north-south trade, also trade with the UK, and also <laughs> trade between Ireland and the rest of the European Union, because 80% of exports that go to Europe use the UK as a land bridge. And if Britain is out of the customs union, then that has really serious implications. So how do we understand the term negotiations Dean Acheson, who was uh, Harry S. Truman's Secretary of State, described them as negotiation in the classic diplomatic sense assumes that the parties are more anxious to agree <coughs> than to disagree. And in the Article 50 negotiations, both sides are anxious to agree. The UK needs a free trade agreement with the EU. It needs to keep participating in EU agencies. It needs to keep participating in research, science and technology development. It needs to participate in the EU's aviational sphere. The EU, in turn, needs access to Britain's market. Uh, it needs access to Britain's heft in uh, military and intelligence affairs. 
One anecdote that I came across was that when Russia invaded Crimea and Ukraine, um, when the EU was drawing up a list of sanctions against uh, individuals, 70% of the names on that list came from British intelligence. So that is a you know something that the EU will potentially lose uh, when, when Brexit happens. So the UK wants something, the EU wants something, they negotiate and they meet in the middle. The problem is that the EU believes that what the UK wants, the UK already has. The EU believes that Britain effectively wants to leave the EU and then tunnel its way back in, hoping that on the way nobody notices that they don't want to abide by the obligations of membership uh, or the obligations of access to the single market. The EU believes, in fact, that the EU, that the UK is sacrificing so much, putting its economic welfare uh, at risk uh, for a glittering prize that dissolves at the point of contact. This, to me, is reflected in Albert Einstein's remark that sometimes you pay the most for the things that you get for, for nothing. So for other reasons, this is actually quite an odd negotiation. There, there's a huge mismatch in what both sides understand as what is up for negotiation. The EU believes that it, if it gave Britain the concessions that it wants on accessing the single market, the EU would actually negotiate itself out of existence. <coughs> now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, I think we have to understand what the EU uh, consists of and what the single market is, is all about. The single market has been painstakingly uh, generated and built up over decades. It exists because of a million deals, compromises, regulations, directives that all other 28 member states or all 28 <coughs> member states have over countless ministerial negotiations signed up to. And if the UK has the same access to, the, to that single market uh, as it does at the moment, but without abiding by the rule book, without accepting the institutional framework, without accepting uh, oversight, monitoring, and the adjudication of the European Court of Justice, then the single market would cease to exist in a meaningful way, uh, as it does at the moment. So in short, the EU believes that, in fact, the, the Britain wants uh, single market and customs union light. But the EU believes that such a thing does not and cannot exist. So that is the essential contradiction as we enter these negotiations. So, th so th I think these negotiations are not like any other negotiations in history because there's such a mismatch between both sides' understanding of, um, of what is at stake. Now, according to the British view, the EU has been uncompromising from the start. Sometimes the target that Eurosceptics uh, point to changes when they complain that Britain is being punished then it's the EU's fault as a whole. When they complain that the EU is being inflexible, then it's Michel Barnier's fault, it's the European Commission's fault. So then they think that Theresa May should appeal over his head to the heads of government directly. When Eurosceptics complain that others want to take advantage of Brexit at the UK's expense, then it's the member states' fault, uh, most notably France. I think because of these differences in interpretation and because of the fact that the EU is starting from a point that it is a treaty based organization that follows the rule of law, then some people describe this as a, a boxing match whereby the referee should have stopped the, the fight um, rounds ago or, or shouldn't even have let the, the bout start. One by one, the UK has had to capitulate to the EU demands before the negotiations have really got underway. At a certain point, Boris Johnson could say, mm -hmm. Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, could say that the EU could go whistle if it expected the UK to pay a hefty exit bill. That has quietly been dropped and the UK has signed up to an exit bill of about 40 billion uh, plus. Other Eurosceptics say that if the UK accepted all the rules of the EU during the transition period, it would become a vassal state. But actually, the UK government has quietly accepted and signed up to all the rules and all the preconditions that the EU has set down in terms of the transition. So in a sense, the UK has had to scrap its opening 
negotiating positions at every turn. And this is understandable because Article 50 gives the advantage to the EU. That's the, that the way it was written, it was written for that purpose. But the one area where the UK hasn't notably caved in, if you like, is the one which interests us. It's the Irish border. During the, referen during the referendum campaign, the Good Friday Agreement barely featured, but it is an international treaty. And that's something that the EU kind of responds to. It's, it, it, it appeals to the EU's erogenous zones, if you like. Um, the EU, again, is, is a treaty-based organization, so it looks at the Good Friday Agreement as an international treaty that it is desperate not to upset. Um, there are two reasons why I think Ireland has managed to get its priorities and imperatives embedded in the EU negotiating mindset. And, and one is that they want to protect the Good Friday Agreement. They don't want to do anything which um, would trigger uh, conflict. I think the EU is actually terrified of doing something or saying something that would uh, reawaken the conflict. And for that reason, they, they take the Irish question very, very seriously. Now, I think the Irish government was aware of this in advance of the negotiations, and they took advantage of this. They realized that two things. One is that Ireland is remaining part of the 27, so it has a natural advantage over the UK. Secondly, the Irish government is aware of the EU's commitment to Ireland uh, beforehand. In fact, the Irish peace process is one of the is one of the kind of conflict resolution episodes that the EU can actually look at and say, well, this is something that the EU helped and is something that the EU is proud of. Because if you look at conflict resolution attempts by the EU in its neighborhood over the years, they have not been very successful. Uh, the EU was vilified uh, at worst for its neglect of the Balkan conflict or its inability to prevent the Balkan conflict. It has been largely uh, a passive bystander in the Middle East, in North Africa, and in, in, in Ukraine. I mean, the, the, the lead players and actors in those conflicts are, are tend to be obviously Russia, France, uh, Germany, the United States, and so on. So before the negotiations really got underway, the Irish government did its homework. It um, did a lot of outreach. I think going back to David Cameron's speech to Bloomberg in 2013, where the idea of a referendum was first presented. The very next day, the Irish uh, Foreign uh, Diplomatic Service was talking to its British counterparts about what this meant, what potentially might come down the tracks. And despite criticism that you get in Ireland, which is understandable that the Irish government haven't really been fully prepared or the civil service haven't been fully prepared, my understanding in researching the book was that the civil service did quite a lot of work uh, ahead of the referendum. A lot more work, obviously, than the UK civil service uh, did, which was zero. I mean, there was, there was no preparation done by the British side uh, whatsoever. So in order for Ireland to embed its priorities in the negotiations, it had to start drafting texts that the UK that, that the EU 27 would be able to accept. This was done through what they call the, the uh, General Secretariat of the European Council. So these would be the people who work for Donald Tusk and they were the ones who were going to be drafting the response to Article 50. So Theresa May would trigger Article 50 saying okay we're leaving. The EU would say right okay we're going to start the negotiations and here is our mandate. Here is the blueprint for how Michel Barnier is going to conduct these negotiations. So if Ireland wanted to be, you know, front and center in those negotiations, they had to get a paragraph into those negotiating guidelines. And, th and they did that. So when the, the guidelines were adopted uh, by the EU 27 at the end of April 2017, one month after Theresa May had triggered Article 50, the Irish clause was in there. It was paragraph 11. And it's, it, I'll give you a, few, a little flavour of what it says. The EU supports uh, the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts and it will continue to support and protect the achievements, benefits and commitments of the Good Friday Agreement. Now these might sound a bit like platitudes uh, but, but every word there has been fought over by the Irish government uh, with the other member states and the European Commission.
the Irish government call these the ABCs, the achievements, benefits and commitments, because the Irish government looks at the Good Friday Agreement in a very broad, expansive way. They look at it as almost a sacred text, which is not so much resolving the past, but is actually setting out the way Ireland progresses in the future. So it, they want to kind of future proof uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, from Brexit and to make sure that any changes to the relationship between Britain and the EU do not damage the Good Friday, Friday Agreement as it progresses into the future. Now, uh, our, this paragraph 11, as we recall, has these magical words that uh, are used over and over again. They talk about the unique circumstances of Ireland. They talk about um, the need for flexible and imaginative solutions. These, these have almost become cliches, in fact, in the negotiations, uh, but they're very important. But just to show you that, in a sense, while the Irish were able to successfully um, embed the Irish question into the, this process, there was a bit of pushback from the other member states and from the European Council. They were effectively saying to Ireland, look, we know this is going to be very damaging for your country. We know the risks. We know the history and the... The, the vulnerability of the peace process, but we cannot promise that the world will not change because the world will change because of Brexit and, and it will change in Ireland more than any other country. So Ireland wanted to have this paragraph 11 saying that the EU will uh, prevent a hard border on the island of Ireland. And the European Council said, uh, uh, we can't say that. Uh, so if you look at the actual wording, it is we will use flexible and imaginative solutions with the aim of preventing a hard border. And those words were like fought over for two weeks with the aim of. The Irish were obviously pushing for a much more explicit commitment from the European Union. The EU were saying we, we can't because we can't promise you that the sky won't fall um, when Brexit happens. Um, but there were other notable, I think, successes from an Irish point of view, if you like. Um, the whole question about a united Ireland and if in the future if there's a united Ireland then Northern Ireland will automatically be part of the uh, European Union. Now a lot of people have been a little bit dismissive of that um, phrase or that, that achievement in the negotiations but actually none of these are given and the EU is very allergic to upsetting any sovereignty issues in other parts of the European Union. Uh, what the Irish government did was they said, OK, look, let's go back to Germany. When Germany was reunified at the end of the 80s, East Germany was automatically brought into the European Union. Now, this, again, was not a given because the criteria that countries have to pass to be able to enter the European Union, to join the European Union, are quite strict in terms of uh, their economies, the way their legal systems work. And East Germany did not qualify, but because of various um, <coughs> bits of fancy footwork done by the Irish government at the time because Ireland had the presidency of the EU. There was a way of getting East Germany to be automatically spirited into the uh, European Union. And this is what the Irish government have achieved uh, on this occasion with um, this unity clause in the negotiating guidelines. Um, the morning those, that, that clause was uh, adopted by the 27 uh, member states, there was a problem. The, the French government looked at this uh, idea about Northern Ireland automatically being part of the EU uh, if there was uh, a united Ireland. And they, the French, being quite legalistic as they are, said, hang on a second, does this mean that the EU is somehow going to be instrumental in bringing about a united Ireland? Because that's not necessarily what we are prepared to to go for uh, and again what i find fascinating about this process is 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 the weight of individual words in the negotiations there was a scrambled meeting that morning between the irish ambassador to the eu uh, the french ambassador and the uh, secretary general of the european council and they met and the irish government pointed to a word and that word was such and the unity clause that was agreed that morning said the Good Friday Agreement, essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, provides for a consent clause. And if that clause is triggered and there is a referendum on unity, such a united Ireland would 
automatically be part of the European Union. So that word such was, the, this is the word the Irish government and their lawyers all huddled over and said, look, is the word such is in there. That means it's only in those circumstances and it's only related to the Good Friday Agreement, which has the famous consent clause. So this is just to give you a sense of um, <coughs> what the Irish government has done so far, but also the pushback that they have had. I mean, I think there's a sense that we hear that the, the European Union is united behind Ireland, but it hasn't been plain sailing and there has been pushback uh, on occasion. Now, I'll, I'll bring you back now to last summer. The negotiations got underway in June. Uh, the night before the negotiations, the Irish told the British negotiating team, "We're not part of. We're not going to be part of this negotiating process. The Irish question will be dealt with separately." And the British were like astonished, saying, "How can you possibly not have the Irish question and the border question uh, in this process that we're now starting?" And the reason was that. The process that was starting in June of last year was essentially a technical process. They were looking at, first of all, the financial settlement that Britain would have to pay when it leaves the European Union. It was looking at the question of citizens' rights in EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the rest of Europe. And to get those issues solved was, was a technical exercise. I mean, how, how much does Britain owe? What is it paying for? What rights do citizens have? You know, how do we en enshrine these rights? The Irish border issue, the, according to the Irish government, was was exclusively a political question. And you often heard this last year with Leo Bradker and Enda Kenny before him saying, we're not getting into a technical solution, we're getting, it's, this, is, this is a political process. And you'll remember that the revenue commissioners had done uh, this huge scoping exercise looking at Norway, Sweden, uh, possible um, high-tech uh, borders, seamless border crossings, and uh, basically they were told to stand down that exercise saying, OK, guys, you're independent, but you're not doing that technical exercise because we do not want to gift wrap a technical solution for the United Kingdom. So from the very beginning, there was a again, a disconnect between what the British government believed the negotiations were about and what the Irish government believed the negotiations were about. So what happened was there was a political a separate strand to the negotiations. It was called a kind of a high level political dialogue by the coordinators. Now that is Ollie Robbins on the British side. He's the chief European advisor for Theresa May and Sabina Vyand, who is the deputy uh, negotiator to uh, for Michel Barnier. So they, they are handling the Irish border issue separately as a political uh, question. Now, the first thing that happened was in the summer, uh, in, uh, in July, the British, the Irish government said to the Commission, who were, this is the task force, this is Michel Barnier's team, would you go and ask Britain what they mean by protecting the Good Friday Agreement? And, and the Commission said, yeah, okay, we'll ask them. So they went off to the British and said, what do you mean by protecting the Good Friday Agreement? And the British said, uh, we don't really know. Um, so, the Commission sent the British government off to to think about what it meant about protecting the Good Friday Agreement, to think about what North-South <coughs> cooperation meant. So that, that off they went uh, in last summer, July and August. Uh, in August, the British produced two papers, one paper on Ireland and another paper on the, cost, the future customs arrangements. Then in September, the EU task force produced its own its, its first paper on on Ireland and it was quite interesting the the British paper on Ireland was 28 pages long it was full of kind of diagnosing the problem first of all it was quite descriptive saying this is the problem that Ireland and the UK faces with the border with uh, with um, you know transit the transit issue in the UK um, the agri food products crossing the border and it had loads of technical fixes and solutions like um, you know, using uh, cameras that can read number plates, having trusted trader schemes where if you're a big enough trader, then you're, you have a kind of a, at the start of the year, you, you have a, you know, a pro forma customs declaration that is all done in advance. Um, and then the, the, ta the, the task force, the, the, my, Michel Barnier's task force kind of brought out its riposte to this paper and it was six pages long 
and people are going, what, you know, what's going on here? The Brit Britain is clearly coming up with technical solutions, and and the um, the task force is saying, well, we're sticking to principles here. But again, this was this was the Irish government's strategy. We're not getting into the technology of it. We're getting we're, we are starting with principles, and those principles have an ask. Okay, so for the first time in September last year, the task force kind of articulated what the Irish border question was about. It wasn't just about trade across the border. It was about the Good Friday Agreement in a, in a kind of in its holistic potential, uh, and that was not just um, you know an all island economy. It was it was societal. It was reconciliation. It was again this kind of slightly sacred. Um, devotion to to a particular way of reading the Good Friday Agreement. Now the UK said, absolutely, we'll sign up to the six principles or the seven principles uh, in in this paper. Um, but the Irish response to that was r reminds me of, of Otto von Bismarck's uh, quote, where he says, "When a man approves of something in principle, it means he hasn't the slightest intention of putting it into practice." And that, that exactly was the Irish government's belief that Britain was saying where do we sign, but they didn't realize that there was an ask from these principles. And when everybody did realize was a key date, and to me this will be like one of the historic dates in the whole Brexit process, November the 8th last year, there was a, uh, an internal working paper leaked uh, from the Michel Barnier's task force. It, was a, it, was a, it had seven bullet points on Ireland. The first uh, two or three bullet points were about the common travel area, saying how much progress had been made on that. Then the other bullet points talked about the mapping process that was underway. Now, remember, I, I mentioned that the, the, the British government was sent off to, to explore what it meant by the Good Friday Agreement, protecting the Good Friday Agreement, what it meant by preserving North-South cooperation. The British government went off and they looked at all the areas of North-South cooperation. Uh, so they drafted in civil servants from London and from Belfast and they come up with a figure of 142 areas where there is north-south cooperation. And what happened then in September was the European Commission Task Force and Irish officials got together in Brussels in a big room with British officials and then later officials from <coughs> Belfast, the Northern Ireland Executive and the Northern Ireland Office. And they looked at this, these 142 areas of north-south cooperation. And they looked at each one in detail to see where does EU law collide with these 142 areas. And I mean, th th this was actually a, a very historic, I think, a turning point in this process, because you look at the Good Friday Agreement and you say, OK, there's six or seven headline areas of cross-border cooperation. But when you drill down into how those areas of cooperation actually work on the ground, how they work on a day to day level, you will find that they are kind of facilitated or enhanced or enabled by the fact that both sides are share the same legal system. They share EU law. So take the health sphere, for example, you have uh, somebody has a heart attack in Letterkenny, they can go to Derry to Alton Galvin Hospital in Derry for a specialized treatment. Uh, if there's a child in Belfast who has cancer, they can go to Dublin for specialized treatment in Crumlin. But all of that specialized treatment is actually enhanced by the fact that they use, they share the same rules of, um, of medical devices, of, of medicine, of uh, um, the, the qualifications of medical personnel, medical professionals are recognized on both sides of the border because of EU law. If you if you wrench EU law away from that equation, then none of that's really going to work in the same way. It's going to be complicated and it's going to be disrupted. And then we get back to the reason we have Article 50, which is to avoid disruption. So that, so within a few weeks, this process of, of examining the 142 areas, um, it became clear very quickly that you need a broad solution to this. So when the British negotiators looked at these seven bullet points in this working paper that was leaked on the 8th of November, they looked at the last one. And the last one said, it seems essential that in order to guarantee no hard border, there will have to be no regulatory divergence on either side of the border on the rules of the single market and customs union.
And of course, the British were astounded by this because this was the first time that we had this whole idea of Northern Ireland being remaining in the customs union and single market. So what this bullet point said was, okay, for all this mapping stuff that we're doing to avoid any disruption in that, we need to keep Northern Ireland in the single market effectively to avoid any border issue, like for trade and goods, you need to have Northern Ireland in the customs union. And, and the task force is saying like, it, it's, it's essential. You know, it seems to us that there's no other way around this. Now, the next day, David Davis was at a press conference in Brussels and he said this effectively would undermine the constitutional arrangements of Northern Ireland. It would, it would place a barrier on the Irish Sea and it's not acceptable. Now the Irish government were, and Irish officials were furious at that because to them, the British side knew this all along. They had actually embarked on this um, mapping exercise. What else did they expect? There was, there was no other way of dealing with this according to the Irish analysis of this. And they felt that the British response was entirely disingenuous and they held, there was, there was absolute fury on the Irish side. So they organized a, a meeting on the 15th of November to clear the air uh, and it didn't actually work. And then about a week later, maybe at the end of that week, Theresa May met Leo Varadkar in Gothenburg. There was an EU summit in Gothenburg and that was the lowest point, I think, in relations there was an extremely difficult meeting and you can see the uh, if you ever get a chance to look back at the at the tv report they were in a very small room on the on the margins of this summit in gothenburg on a tiny table i think their knees must have even been touching uh, and they both looked extremely uncomfortable and when they came out theresa may said something like we're both on the same page we both want the same outcomes but the irish government were furious because they said we're not on the same page at all the, the british government do not get it they do not get that uh you know, in order to avoid a hard border, which is what you say you want, you have to actually get out of your comfort zone as far as unionism is, is concerned and in, at least engage with the idea of Northern Ireland staying in the customs union and single market. Um, so what happened next then was, of course, none of this could progress for Britain uh, until these issues were sorted. So just to refresh your memory, at the end of last year, Britain was desperate to get into phase two of the negotiations because they needed to get into the uh, trade negotiations. But of course, the rules, according to Article 50, were that you can't do that until you sort out the Irish border, the financial settlement and, and citizens' rights. And it was clear that progress was being made in the financial settlement. I mean, the, the British side were, were lowering their red lines all the time and saying, OK, we'll pay uh, this amount, we'll pay 20 billion. And of course, it went up to, to 40 billion. And on citizens' rights, that was all being resolved as well. And suddenly the Irish question was being the big question that the people had kind of disregarded for months. Apart from those of you who bought my book, obviously. <laughs> um, so it was actually quite exciting last year because we were heading towards a showdown in December. Britain would not get into phase two of the negotiations unless they grappled with this Irish nettle of embracing the single market and customs union for Northern Ireland. So the negotiations on how to find a set of words to reflect that began on the 30th of November of last year. Now, the choreography of this, if you recall, was that Jean-Claude Juncker was going to meet Theresa May in Brussels for lunch. They were going to sign off on the deal. And then two weeks later, the heads of government would come along and say, right, we accept Britain's done, made sufficient progress on these three areas. We can now go ahead in phase to phase two. So um, everything had to be agreed on the 4th of uh, December. On the 30th of November, Irish and British and EU officials got into a room to start the negotiations on how they would do this. Uh, and the British were still resisting any idea that Northern Ireland would still be in the customs union and single market. And they, of course, were saying, no, 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 we, we will solve the problem by having a broad free trade agreement with the EU in the future or we will solve it by having these technical solutions, which the EU had kind of rejected as magical thinking. These are the kind of unicorn spaceships you may have heard about, you know, <laughs> floating over the border. Uh, that, that's a slightly pejorative way of putting it, obviously, but uh, that, that was the kind of flack that was attracting at the time. Um, an interesting thing happened, uh, which <coughs> hasn't been reported on, um, is that when that meeting started on the 30th of November, the Irish government said, okay, 
I'll tell you what, you can have your free trade idea and your technical solutions idea, as well as the what became known as the backstop, the idea of Northern Ireland staying in the customs union. So the Irish government actually made quite a, a risky concession up front. They said, okay, we'll have all three options in there. Now, they, they've been called, now, now they're called option A, B, and C. A, again, just to remind you, A is that the future trade agreement between the EU and the UK will be so brilliant and so deep and so comprehensive that there will be no need for a border between uh, North and South. Option B is the technical solutions, the trusted traders, this, this, the, the license plate scanning, the cameras and so on. And option C, of course, is the Irish government's backstop saying, OK, if none of those options work, then option C will be the backstop. Northern Ireland will remain largely in the customs union and single market. So this was kind of grappled over that weekend. And um, the phrase they were using, of course, was there'd be no regulatory divergence. OK, what does that mean? It means that um, things would kind of stay the same north and south of the border. Northern Ireland would still abide by the customs union rules. So you wouldn't have to have customs checks. They would still abide by the single market largely. Theresa May was really not happy with this because she knew, of course, that she couldn't get this past the unionists and she was dependent on the DUP for survival. So on the Sunday night, like the night before the lunch, the Irish government agreed to a, a change in the, in the kind of syntax or, or the, the semantics of, of, of the text. And they said, OK, instead of no regulatory divergence, we will have continued regulatory alignment. Now, to most people like me included, this is like dancing on the head of a pin, like, you know, what's the difference? The key difference is that <clears throat> alignment to British ears is a voluntary act. It's saying we as the United Kingdom will align ourselves with the EU rulebook. No regulatory divergence, on the other hand, means that you're kind of bound, you're binding yourself to a straight line, that you're not going to step away from this line. So to the British to British sensitivities, this was a, a bridge too far. They would prefer to say, okay, we will sort of step up to the EU rulebook and we will, it, I mean, it's, it's been described as train tracks, okay? They're not, they're not one line, it's train tracks, okay? Um, so that, that, was, that was easier for the British government to swallow. And the Irish government said, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll seek legal advice. And, and the Irish government did, they went to the Attorney General and they discovered that the term alignment is actually quite well established in international law. Um, if a country wants to join the EU, it has to align its legislation with the EU rulebook. So the Irish government felt, well, actually, this is okay. We can live with this. The, tr the trouble is that a country joining the EU is converging with the EU rulebook. Britain is leaving the EU, so it's actually going in the opposite direction. Anyway, that, that's, that was an observation. The deal was done. Um, that morning before the lunch happened, there was an extraordinary cabinet meeting in Dublin where Leo Varadkar explains the, the meaning of these phrases and, and what was on offer. And um, I actually, in Brussels, had been trying to work sources that morning. And I, I got a source to confirm to me that this key paragraph about no regulatory divergence. I got a second source on that. And they said, yeah, that, that, that's what's in the text. But then she came back and said, actually, it's been changed to continued regulatory alignment. Now, at that stage, I couldn't really see the difference. But to me, the key thing was that the, the, from a point in early November, when the UK had gone nuts when they heard this idea that Northern Ireland would stay in the customs union, they had now, it looked like they were actually accepting the idea. So to me, this was a kind of a concession. And the, source, the sources I spoke to as well said, this is a huge concession by Britain. Now look what they're signing up to. So RTE actually broke the story uh, before the lunch happened. And I, I put a few things out on Twitter. And the DUP were that moment in number nine Downing Street going through the text with the chief of staff of the uh, of Theresa May. I um, can't remember his name for the moment. Um, but... The DUP were going through the text when they saw my tweet. <laughs> I said, "Hang on, hang on a second. We're we're not. We're, this is not what we signed up for. This is not we. This is not our understanding of what this means." Now, the thing is, at that stage, nobody knew the full extent of the um, of the text, and nobody knew really that there was <coughs> that this 
backstop idea or option C was going to be like a kind of default. If the other two options don't work, then this will kick in. But I mean, as a journalist, this was a kind of tricky moment for me, but you know, a journalist have to report what they know. They can't second guess the wider context. As long as you report it, I suppose, carefully and responsibly. And what the way we reported it was um, the UK is prepared to accept no regulatory divergence according to a draft seen by RTE News. And then the, the second paragraph after that was, it's not clear if both, if both governments have, ag have agreed to this, but this is part of a draft that RTE has seen. So we, we were saying, look, we don't know the final outcome, but this is in the draft. Mm -hmm. And actually the draft had stayed intact all that weekend. So when we, the unionists were spooked uh, and they ran out down the steps in Stormont and said, we're not, we're not accepting this. And you know, I was personally accused of, of having destroyed the agreement uh, and um, having spooked the DUP horses. Uh, anyway, that's, um, that, that, was, that was the kind of environment at the time and the atmosphere. But what happened was that they, the negotiators got back around, around the phones and uh, they, they more or less produced the same agreement. But there was this extra paragraph, paragraph 50, which said there won't be any barriers between Northern Ireland and, and the rest of the UK as a result of this. So what happened next? Well, Britain then got the go ahead to enter phase two. And then the, 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 the negotiating guidelines were updated. There was a, a what they call an anti-backsliding clause in there. There was a warning in there that Britain could not, you know, resile or retreat from the commitment it had just made in this joint report. But then the EU basically had to start drafting the withdrawal treaty. Now, let's go back to what I said at the beginning. Why do we need negotiations? We need negotiations because there has to be a treaty that guides Britain out of the EU. And this treaty has to be ready by October because it, it needs to be ratified. And so the EU had to start drafting this treaty and it was, it was being drafted in a fairly feverish atmosphere because everybody knew the political backdrop to this. British officials weren't part of the drafting, obviously, but they knew what way the drafting was going. <coughs> and they were kept saying, Ollie Robbins kept saying, look, uh, look what's happening in Belfast. The you know, DUP are not going to like this. You know, the, the assembly has collapsed. Uh, it, it hasn't been uh, reactivated. You know, be careful what you do here. I mean, the British were basically at every stage trying to limit or kill off this idea of Northern Ireland staying in the customs union and single market. And the Irish government was saying, no, no, it has to stay in there. So the British were putting up taboos and the Irish were saying, no, you can't have those taboos. And, and the Europeans were in the middle going, ah, these crazy Irish and British, what are they doing to us? Uh, but anyway, um, at the end of February, the draft treaty was, uh, or the first draft of, of this treaty was published. And the, I mean, this was gone over for weeks by officials by the legal services in the European Commission and the European Council uh, and the task force. And they tried to present this thing in, in as technocratic a style as possible. It was a very dry kind of, I mean, this is a treaty, so it's like 130 pages. Um, but even though they tried to make this as kind of technocratic and dry as possible, there were phrases that jumped out at you. Northern Ireland would be considered part of the territory of the customs union. I mean, the word territory alone, you can just see how that would be a red rag uh, to unionism. Um, there would be a common regulatory area on the island of Ireland governing goods. So there'd be no restrictions on goods. And basically, if you think about it, this is saying, OK, you want no hard border. This is how you do it. And this is the legal text that will make that operational. Operationalizing is the word that they use. Of course, the British went bananas. Theresa May went into the House of Commons saying no British government could ever accept this. <coughs> And there was a crisis yet again. Now, what happened since then was kind of politics, I guess. And the, British, the Irish government was saying, OK, we were expecting this. But they found it, again, uh, not nonsensical that the British didn't expect this, because this was basically giving legal effect to the deal that the British had signed up to in December. Uh, now, once you put it down in stark legal language, it looks frightening, and of course, the uh, DUP uh, couldn't couldn't abide it. Um, but the key thing then was that there, there's always this pressure from the other side that you, Britain can't move forward unless it abides by its commitments. And, and the moving forward bit that Britain needed, of course, was the transition. Because the, the British 
business sector, uh, the CBI, are begging Theresa May to agree a transition so that nothing happens that's different in, at the end of March next year. There'll be a two-year period where everything stays the same. But Britain couldn't get this transition unless it, the other 27 agree to it. So in, in a sense, in February, March, the Irish government had the potential to say, OK, we're not agreeing this transition until Britain actually agrees this legal text. But this was a bit of a tricky time for the Irish government because of all countries, Ireland also needs the transition. Because think of all the beef farmers and dairy, dairy producers and fishing organisations. They need things to stay the same at the end of March next year. So the Irish government didn't necessarily want to be the, the party that, that, that blows up the uh, transition. So there were again intense negotiations and eventually they got the British side to commit to the, the December agreement. So Theresa May wrote a letter to Donald Tusk saying that she would abide by um, all of the elements of the December joint report, including the backstop. And just before the March summit, which approved the transition, the latest draft of the withdrawal agreement was, was published. It was done and actually color coded. So any, anything in green was stuff that's agreed. Anything in yellow was, OK, the outcomes are agreed, but the technical aspects of how to get there haven't been agreed. Anything in white um, was just simply not agreed. And the whole Irish protocol was not agreed, obviously. But uh, front and center at the start of that draft treaty was a paragraph saying, Basically, Britain has to abide by the promises in December. So when they had those two things, the Irish government could say, OK, right, we, fine, we, we, uh, we can now accept that the transition goes ahead, that we now start the process towards the future trade agreement. And uh, again, the crisis was averted. But of course, that caused a lot of unease in Ireland because Fianna Fáil said, look, Britain's getting away with murder here. I mean, we, we had this promise in December. They backslid from that. They're now saying they're not going to accept it. Um, and I think the the uh, bilateral or, or the, the, the kind of bipartisan approach uh, to Brexit has fractured because of this. So I'll, I'll bring things to a close and then take questions. But just to kind of point out where things are going to go from here. Over the next six weeks, um, there are going to be intense negotiations between the EU task force and, and Britain over the Irish protocol and, and the Irish issue. Now, the common travel area has been more or less agreed. Um, one issue that's coming up that, that is proving to be a lot trickier, I think, than people realised is the question of, of human rights in Northern Ireland. There are rights that are enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement that are reflected in EU uh, rights and fundamental rights. And these are tricky because you would have a scenario where you have to create a mechanism that gives people in Northern Ireland um, protection under those rights, but people in the rest of the UK wouldn't have those protections. So it's, it's, it's proving uh, difficult. The other problem is that Britain has kind of got out of jail in a sense with this um, uh, with this Irish protocol. OK, Theresa May has written a letter. She's promised uh, X, Y and Z to Donald Tusk. And we have this box at the beginning of the, of the withdrawal treaty. But we are now in the realm of the future trade talks. OK, and to the UK negotiators that I've spoken to, they think this changes everything. So all the stuff about technical solutions and, uh, you know, a future free trade agreement solving the border like magic, they say, well, we couldn't really get into those before because we we're all in phase one, but now we're fully in phase two. So we can actually start talking about these flexible and imaginative solutions. But you see, the problem again is that the, to, the flexible and imaginative solutions for Britain are completely different from the flexible and imaginative solutions as envisaged by the EU and by Ireland. So we now have the next rendezvous, which is June, the June summit. And there is language in the last summit that says Britain will have to abide by its commitments by June. Um, if there's no agreement in June, then it gets into October. And as, as, as I said before, October is the ultimate deadline, really. I mean, it might drift into November or December even, but 
I mean, Britain is leaving the EU at the end of March next year, so this has to be sorted. And the problem for Ireland is in these negotiations that if it doesn't get agreed in June, if this backstop isn't given hard and fast legal effect, then it drifts into October and then you get a pressure cooker situation. And we know from negotiations, if we talk about negotiating the negotiations, that's what you want to avoid in negotiations. You want to avoid a pressure cooker where you suddenly have to drop your red lines and the Irish government may be forced into abandoning its uh, devotion to the backstop. So that's the scenario we're in at the moment and um, that's where I'll leave it and I'll be happy to take questions from, from here on in.